Good morning. Uh, we'd like to get started, so we'll stay as close to time as possible. Um, my name is Sue Bartle, and I'm the School Library System Coordinator at the Erie 2 Chautauqua Cataragas BOCES. And I want to welcome everyone here today. Um, this has been uh, an event in planning. It's like planning a wedding. <laughs> yes, are they coming? Are we Skyping? Will they be here? Will the book be here on time? All of those things. So the bride and groom have shown up, and we're ready to go. Uh, I, w I have a bunch of people to thank, um, specifically all the librarians who have helped out. You all are very, very dedicated here at, um, at our school library system, and it really shows with our turnout today and the support that you get from for your library, so we're going to continue to do that. Um, I want to specifically thank my secretary, Tess Schmiegel. She's just the backbone of everything that we do, and she just makes sure that the office keeps running smoothly wherever I am, and things keep happening, so it's really great. And of course, all of you hear me talk about my husband. I have to give him a shout out. He couldn't be here this morning because he came in last night to bring in our final speaker who had to come on a late flight because of all the difficulties in um, metropolitan New York, unfortunately. So. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Mark Aronson, who will introduce Lee Berger. And I just have to say that um, we've been working with Mark since December and doing some amazing things with Common Core and nonfiction, and I feel very fortunate to be doing that and watch for other things. We have an article coming out in School Library Journal. It should be on the web very shortly on Common Core and nonfiction. So uh, Mark will introduce Lee, and we'll get started. We're just starting out and I'm already interrupting. My name is Marianne Cappiello. I'm a professor in the Graduate School of Education at Lesley University in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And so I'm gonna be working with you later today. But before Mark and Lee start telling you the story um, of Skull in the Rock and talk about both the research and, and the book itself, I wanna get you started from a teaching perspective. So at each table, you have a set of blue vocabulary cards. Some tables might have two sets. And what I'd like you to do just for the next four or five minutes or so is at your table, divide up the cards and look at them and start talking with your neighbor about what you think the concepts might mean. What are some of the unfamiliar vocabulary words? I think that there are some tables that might be loaded with science teachers and so it might be an easier conversation for some of them. Um, but uh, take a moment, explore the words, talk about them, and if possible, group them in ways that might make sense. And we'll come back in about five minutes. So, I'm going to interrupt your work, and number one, I want to apologize. I think I hit most of the tables, but it's braided stream, not braided steam. So conceptually, that was probably a really interesting conversation, and I apologize for the missing R. Um, so let's hear from some tables how you grouped the words. Is there a brave table that wants to... You might have some, some words coupled together. Trios. Well, why don't we have them do it again after the first Yeah. Oh, we have a brave soul in a purple shirt. Thank you. Okay. And Excellent. The, so, so good. So we're working with some concepts and some metaphors. And um, you used the text feature there of the quotation marks to logically group. And then you took some prior knowledge to inform your grouping. And you also used the book as a resource. Yes. OK, so they had what they knew together and what they didn't know together. Excellent. Well. This was to get your juices flowing, your brains thinking, and now we're going to turn the, turn the program over to Mark and Lee, and we can come back to these words later in the day. Thanks. 
So, hi, I'm um, Mark Aronson, and um, I'm going to tell you a little about myself and how it led to the opportunity to work with Lee on this book, and then you'll get to meet Lee and go on quite an ad adventure ride uh, of discovery and exploration. And then I'll come back and talk a little bit um, about how we tried to translate all of that into books that communicate uh, with you and with the young people you you work with. Um, I do, though, have a rule for when I speak, and I'm going to modify it slightly because I can't uh, speak for Lee, but my rule is whenever I give a talk, you must interrupt. And the reason I say this, and I say this to everyone from when I go to school visits for preschoolers to we're all theoretically grown up here, um, I, say, I, I, I say it because my feeling is when you're bubbling with a question, when something really bothers you and you're angry and you disagree or wow, that sparks a thought and you'd love to go further, that's the time to say it. You don't want to say it an hour later where we're all rushing to the restrooms and, and no one's really going to listen to you. So I really do mean it that when I'm speaking, please do interrupt. I, I know that Lee said, I think he has more of a beginning, middle, and end, so perhaps you'll wait, for, but he does want your questions. We really do want, this is, we're not here to lecture you in some way to put you into a slumber. We're here to create ideas and dialogue and to, to, to work together to understanding. So really do feel free to raise your hand, to speak up, to ask questions, to take this as an opportunity to learn together, not just for us to preach. And, and in that context, let me tell you how this happened, how I, how I got to be here. And that is, I have a doctorate in American history, but for 25 years I've worked as an editor of books for kids of all ages, from picture books up, and then writing nonfiction books for middle grade and high school. And so why? Why would I go to the bother of getting a doctorate not to be teaching in a history department, but to be writing and editing books for young people? It was because I always felt there was this strange disconnect that in the academy was where knowledge was being found, where researchers were at the edge of knowledge discovering things, inventing things, being creative, going into new places. But by the time that got to young people who are bubbling with questions and full of curiosity and interested in the world, it had been flattened out, it was years behind, they weren't getting the latest, it was, it, it was turned into textbooks, it was turned into things. It, the, the impossible goal of making the world dull had been achieved. And I, I thought this was a bad goal. I, I wanted to try to find a way to link this place where the new is happening intellectually with readers who are, are absolutely ready to embrace and understand the new and, and the, the develop, knowledge developing all around them. So that's what I devoted my career to doing. And then... In particular, when I had been an 11, 12-year-old, I really wanted to be an archaeologist. I was fascinated with archaeology. But I gave up. I got discouraged because I felt the way I read about it, everything had been found. Schliemann found Troy. Great for Schliemann. Bad for me. Sir, Sir, Sir Arthur Evans found Knossos. Great. I can go visit. As it turned out, he completely reconstructed it. It's a theme park of Knossos built by Sir Arthur Evans, but okay. Um, and so, but I got to live out my childhood fantasy when I spent part of a couple of summers at Stonehenge working with a team of archaeologists, and I wrote a book about it called If Stones Could Speak. And in the book, I said, I told this story about how I had always believed that all the good stuff had been found. And the correct answer is that is completely not true. We're only beginning, beginning, beginning to understand even the places that have been exposed to light, what they really mean. You know, you all know about carbon-14 dating. Carbon-14 dating was not really meaningful until the 90s, right? Is that it was recalibrated 
in the 90s. So if you were saying, you say, oh, we know when that was. It was carbon-14 dated. No, we had to really even understand that tool to really begin to apply it. So then I saw in the New York Times an article, a front page of the New York Times, showing the smiling face of Dr. Lee uh, Berger and his son Matthew in front of a, a glass case um, with the skeleton of this uh, Australopithecus sediba that, um, that Matthew had and then Lee had found. And I thought, this is what a great subject, but I wasn't sure how to pursue it. And then National Geographic, which had published uh, If Stones could, could Speak, called me up one day and said, you know, we met with Lee Berger and Lee's made this amazing discovery, but the one thing he says is that when he was growing up, he felt like all the good stuff had already been found. And so the first book that he wants to come to the world about his discovery is not an adult book, is not something for the six academics who are going to read it. He wants to write a book for kids because he wants young people to know about this adventure of exploration and discovery. Exactly the same words I had written in If Stones Could Speak. And so I had then the really great privilege of working with Lee. And I'll tell you one thing about that. I just made two conditions for writing the book. I said, I have to go to South Africa to be, meet with Lee, to go to Malapa, to see the work. And I have to bring my then 11-year-old son to meet his now 12-year-old, or 12 or 13 now. 14, oh my God, life moves too quickly. Um, um, so that they could talk to each other. And they, Nat Geo said yes, and out of that came uh, the Skull in the Rock. So that's the background of what brings us, us together. I think you guys are now really fortunate. You're going to hear from really the leading paleoanthropologist in the world. He was just honored in Washington at a group called the Academy of Achievement, where basically the top people in, in their fields are go get to meet with the Supreme Court, go get to meet with Colin Powell, go get to meet with movers and shakers to create the future because they're recognized as the leaders who have that capacity. So that originally brought Lee to America now and he's going to tell you about what led him and his son or his son and him and, and their dog Tao to to make this discovery and how, what it, how it might be important for you and the young people you work with to know about this, not just to add another name to their collection of names to know, but really to open windows of discovery to the whole world. So Lee, come.